Well, welcome to the Lovecraft Easy podcast. I hope everyone had a great holiday season. We haven't, uh, gosh, we haven't been on since before Christmas. So I did. I got a Lord of the Rings book from my wife and um, a few other nerd, nerd things. So I got Tim Wagoner with us. He's our guest. Hey, Tim. Hey. And uh, I'm Mike Davis, of course. Alan Hughes is with us tonight. Hey, Alan. Hello. And Mark Rainey. Yeah, uh, my my favorite nerd thing <laughs> I got for Christmas. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. And then, uh, Mark, you've got a new, we're going to have you on as a, as a guest in a month or two, but you've got a new book out that you edited. That's right. Uh, Death Realm Spirits. And at the that came out from Shortwave publishing uh alan the scoof that la stufa sorry is uh, the publisher at shortwave and he said he could be on the show and i think brian keen and dave wilson uh heather darty the author and in tony yeah. trembley yeah yeah who were in the in the book uh said uh, they could make it as well that, that sounds great so rick is here too hey rick hi hey rick um, I all do. right, well, let, let's get started. Um, so, um, I guess if you're new, if this is your first episode, we talk about cosmic horror and so forth, but we also talk about uh, general horror, weird fiction, books, movies. We're, we're a bunch of geeks, so talk about, talk about horror a lot. Um, so, Tim is a horror writer. You've written a hell of a lot of books over the years. And you've recently published a book on writing, so um, we wanted to talk to you about that. What's tell the listeners about the book, the title, and and so forth, and we'll go from there. Well, the most recent book on writing I did was called "Let Me Tell You a Story," and what I do is I have short stories from the beginning of my career all the way up to pretty much now, and talk about you know how they were constructed and what I would do differently now. Um, examine some changing things in terms of like um, just a greater awareness people have today of, of, of things like ableism and stuff that, uh, you know, sort of things that showed up in horror that nobody really thought about too much. You know, it's like you know, Quasimodo and, uh, is, you know, a pretty sympathetic character, but he's still portrayed as like the other and, you know, something, something horrible. And some of that, you know, I saw my earlier work, things like that over time. Uh, and the reason because it's, those are the only stories I knew how they were actually made. <laughs> so I can talk about you know, short story principles in them. And they're different than my other two books on, on writing because those things were more instruction manuals while this is more reflective. Uh, it's kind of a mixture of memoir, short story collection, and how-to. So, Well, uh, okay, so the, the difference being this latest book, you've, um, you, you've gone over a lot of your short stories from the past and looked at them with a critical eye. What would I have done better? What did I like? That sort of thing, right? So if someone has not read any of these as of yet, would you recommend that they start with the latest one and then go go back? Does it matter? What, what are your thoughts? I guess it depends on what people are looking for. You know, if you're if you the kind of person that likes the story notes that come after a collection that sometimes people put in, you know, let me tell you a story is a good one. Um, if you're looking for horror writing instruction, writing in the dark is probably the best one since it just covers everything. And then the one in between is a workbook that goes with writing in the dark. And while I made that so that you could use it on your own, um, it's, it's full of exercises. So if you're you know an exercise geek, that's be a wonderful book for you. But if you're just looking for overall instruction, I go for writing in the dark. Okay. Um, talk about some of the stories that you selected from for the latest book and maybe just a couple of examples if you can of of what you would change you know give the give the audience a, kind of a sense of what this book does um well that's a really good question the the first few stories i mean they're from the very first one i put in is from when i was in uh, uh still in college uh, that i wrote for creative writing class and it was published in a couple published and republished in a couple of um you know very small press publications back in the 
guess it would have been early 90s. Um, but one of those is, is a story called Huntress, which was about a, a succubus that um, she's starting to get tired of what she's doing. And she's kind of going through the motions, although she doesn't know she is yet. And by the end of the night, she lets her prey go, you know, and she's realizing that she's probably going to starve to death at this point because she's got too much sympathy for her prey. It may not be soon, but it's going to happen eventually. Right. Um, and so I read this story in, in class because that there was a read aloud workshop on one of the students whose name I can't remember. She said, write that story. And I've said, what do you mean? And she said, well, you're a, that story is from a female's point of view. You can't write it. Yeah. And I said, well, this story is about, you know, an inhuman monster who could be either sex. She happened to be, you know, presenting as female that night. She said, it doesn't matter. And I'm like, well, okay, well, you know, thanks for your feedback. And the next week she brought a story in and read it. And it was from the point of view of a little boy. And so when it was done, I just said, well, you know, last week you told me, you know, that, that I needed to be the same gender. So why did you choose a little boy? And she said, oh, that's different. Women are so sensitive. We can write from any kind of point of view. And so I was like, okay. And, you know, it started to teach me about um, just how to take different, you know, critiques or whatever. But it also taught me to think about that principle that she said, you know, to think about, do I feel like I can do justice to a certain point of view or, you know, not to just pick it to pick it, you know, like thinking, oh, I'm going to write about being what it was like to be Chinese in the 17th century China. Uh, even with all the research I do, I don't know that I, you know, I could ever do a good job of that. Probably an okay job of a, a monster hunting the souls to to eat but uh, for, uh, you said that you did that in uh, around college was yeah yeah i actually so, read that story yeah. and uh i thought you know for that period in in your life or career you did um you did a pretty convincing job in a lot of cases there oh uh, i appreciate that thanks and when I went to publish it, the first place was to a literary journal that made me add a whole bunch of stuff. And then when I reprinted it, it was in uh, the mythic, mythic Circle. So it was more of a fantasy kind of publication. They had me take out every single thing the other editor had me put in. <laughs> and so that was a really good education in that, you know, editors are just different. You know, it's not necessarily right or wrong. It's just different. And uh, so that was a pretty good. So I got a couple of really good lessons out of that one. What is the name of this story? That one's called Huntress. Mm -hmm. Where can we find it if someone listening wants to read it today? Um, I don't know if it's anywhere except for in uh, Let Me Tell You a Story. It's the, I believe it's yeah, the your first. new book. It, right, right. It, obviously. It's the lead off, yeah. 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 Um, yeah, Huntress. Okay. The, you know, that seems to be sometimes quite the sensitive topic, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Um you know, do you have the right to write or create from another point of view than yourself? Uh, you know, to take it further, can, can you write from the point of view of a Native American or, as you said, a Chinese a couple hundred years ago? The, you know, I think you, if you're being respectful to that and you've researched it as much as you can, we can't just be writing if, if you're an old white guy uh, like I think everyone here, except for mm -hmm. except for Mark, <laughs> yeah, we can't yeah. just be writing from the. I'm an old old white guy. <laughs> from the viewpoint of a white, uh, old white guy, right? Um, otherwise, you're just doing, you know, almost like reportage. You know, it's nonfiction mm -hmm. at that point. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, a lot of times it doesn't matter because you might write stories that, they, if you were to cast it like a film, just about anybody could play a part. Um, so the like race doesn't matter in the the hunter story at all because it does it's not a factor. Um, youth does because she picks the guy up at like a just kind of a dance club, and uh, so it's it works better if he's younger. Um, she's who knows how many centuries old, so I just have to imagine that perspective. But you know, these days it's at least right now it's a lot easier for me than it was in my my twenties. Yeah, you but know, yes, back back in the day, Tim. That I kind think of, Sorry, yeah, go, ahead. go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. Uh, back in the day, uh, the Lawrence Block burglar in the closet stories. All right, so I remember reading an essay from him by him when 
the movie came out starring Whoopi Goldberg. And it's been decades, but it was just the nicest essay. Like he was, th that's how they see this character. Could, could Bernie be a African-American woman instead of a white guy? Yeah, sure. Here she is, you know? So, and you're, you're pretty familiar with Block, aren't you? You used to read his column. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. He was really influential on me and I've read a ton of his mystery books. I just love him. Um, but I think it's, you know, I don't know if I learned this from him, but I wouldn't be surprised is that, you know, if you, you write your characters as human beings, you know, the outer stuff about them doesn't matter as much, you know, unless you're t trying to tell a story about like, what it was it like to be gay in the eighties during the AIDS crisis. Um, I was around at that time and I had gay friends. Um, it's not the kind of story I'd, I would try to tell. I, I, I didn't live it. Uh, none of my close friends passed away from it. So something like that, I wouldn't do. Uh, but otherwise, you know, just writing, you know, people as human. I, I, you know, and I usually alternate between male and female characters anyway. You know, women are like half the human race a little bit more. So I feel weird not including <laughs> or not, you know, writing from the point of view. So far, you know, over the years, people seem to think I do okay. Nobody, people have, you know, said you do fine or nobody's, you know, tried to hunt me down with pitchforks and, you know, flaming <laughs> torches, saying that, you know, you're doing a terrible job. Although if people thought I did, I would want to hear so I could improve. But yeah, um, but yeah, I just, I, I try to just to treat them as people, try to find the part of me that I could connect to whatever it is they're doing. I think it's easier in short stories because you can focus on, oh, this person, you know, does not want to be, they have a fear of being imprisoned for whatever reasons. And you don't have to go into a whole lot more about their life and their background. I think it's a lot harder probably in a novel where you're expected to flesh these characters out in ways that, you know, most of us probably can't. We can't have some kind of connection to them. Yeah, you, you wrote a, um, you print, you published the, I think, what is it, the introduction to the book on your blog? Yeah. Okay, it's, uh, it's Writing in the Dark. Uh, That's the first one. Yeah, Writing in the Dark. I'll include the link to this. So you don't have to type it out, folks. But but yeah, this is the. Is this the introduction to the first one or the, the um, latest one? Oh, well, that's a good question. Since I'm not looking at it. Uh, let's see um, the story behind. Let me tell you a story. So it must be the yeah latest. Yeah, that's course. it. Yep, that's it. Helps if I scroll up. Uh, there are 14 stories in the book, five of which have never been reprinted after their initial appearances. So. I really like this quote from Michael A. Arz Arnzen. Arnzen. Yeah, Arnzen. You can trust him to teach you not so much how to write, per se, but how to think like a horror writer. This basically means that you'll instinct instinctively know how to chill someone with a disturbing idea, outsmart them with an outrageous twist ending, or caution them with a clever moral lesson, and it will all come naturally to you. He's a masterful educator on the dark side. And I wanted to sort of focus on that. This isn't just a writing book. It's a writing, it, it's a how to write horror book. Yeah, all three of them are. Even though there are principles, of course, you could take to any kind of writing. But yeah, I'm really focusing on horror writing. Uh, what are some of the maybe different things that you teach that if you were writing a book on just general writing, maybe you wouldn't say? Um, well, I talk about you know, what makes a monster? Um, I, you know, I always tell people, you know, if, just imagine a monster like walking around in a field. It's not a monster until somebody's there to perceive it or feel threatened by it or to feel like this thing can't possibly be and it shakes their, you know, what they think of as reality. Um, you know, the monster happens inside a character. Horror happens inside a character. Um, if you don't write horror with some kind of connection to or, or showing us some kind of uh, insight into the character's inner world like if it's just a movie you imagine it just as a movie screen mm -hmm. um, it really loses its impact uh, it, it's i mean all stories are about people on some level um, unless it's like some kind of weird experimental thing or it's a lamppost as the character but even then you write it like it's a person almost um, I, I really think that's a big thing. And I think it's probably, you know, writing with at least somewhat of a close point of view is good for just about any kind of fiction. But I think it's vital for horror fiction if you really want it to be impactful. 
So someone out there is listening and they're, they're a beginning writer. And what are a couple of ob observations or key points from this book that you say st start here and go from here after you've learned this? Well, that's a really good question. Um, well, you know, one of the things I've noticed, I've been teaching creative writing for a lot of years, and I can take a short story, um, used to be, you know, hard copy, now, now it's just online. But when it was hard copy, I could flip to the third page and put my finger in the middle, and that's where the story always started. Uh, mm -hmm. People just take so long yeah. to to try to figure out, and it's because they're trying to orient themselves in the world of the story, just, you know, as the creator of it. And they don't think as much about how somebody perceives it when they read it, which is fine in a first draft as long as you go through and fix it. Um, and then with the ending, I tell them, you know, you want to try it for a short story to start as close to the ending as possible uh, in a lot of ways. Um, I had a story, I, can't, I think it's in, uh, let me tell you a story, but I had originally written it uh, 14 pages, but when an anthology came up that needed stories that were only three pages long, all I did was take the last scene and submit it, and it was published. Because And I realized that last scene, the whole story embodied it, or was embodied in it. And I felt really stupid for having, having written like 11 pages I didn't need. But it was a really good lesson. Um, so those two things, I think that, you know, beginners uh, really, really helps them to think about. Um, that close point of view. Trying to describe things too pretty well, you know, trying to be, uh, I use a uh, technique that I call or, or call anchor points where you try to anchor the story in reality because it's an illusion of reality. So it's kind of like the old fashioned tents that were just kind of canvas and some, you know, poles and some rope that gives the illusion of like the shape of a tent, but it's not really, you know, a, a, a solid kind of thing. So when you're writing a scene, you want to use like mix up different senses. Like you might have a sight, you might have a a sound, you might have a and not just senses, a, a character thought, and then you might have a character move. And if you do that, and it's you you kind of constantly as you go through your story, you know, weave these things in, your story will feel real uh, to your readers. Um, it's a lot like if you ever saw the the the. I'm sure they don't do this much anymore, but you can go YouTube it and find it. Uh, the people that would do the spinning plates on the sticks and they would spin a plate and for a while it would wobble, you know, just spin till it started to wobble. And then they come back and hit that one. And then they're constantly doing this for like their six or seven plates they have out. And I tell people that that's what you do as a writer. If you hit like a smell plate, you don't have to put a smell in for a while because that will still stay there for the reader for a little while till that kind of starts to fade. And then you hit it again. Uh, and same thing with any side, same thing for like a character thought or a movement. Uh, and a lot of that is just instinct or playing around with it. But it reminds you to kind of keep the different, you know, anchor points that are there. Uh, and that works really well. And I think it's really good in horror because I do think that uh, sensory stuff, unless you're writing very intellectual horror that really takes place deeply inside somebody's mind, I think that having a certain amount of, uh, uh, you know, back and forth between the character's outer world and inner world is pretty important. Those are incredible observations. Um, mm -hmm. But as you say, you've been teaching creative writing for a very long time. What are, what are some of the mistakes that you've, you've seen over and over, uh, over the years that beginning writers make? And maybe, you know, if they're listening to you now and they say, okay, I'm, I can avoid this. Yeah. The 20, People in their 20s write about their friends hanging out, talking, um, drinking, smoking cigarettes, having sex, but nothing else occurs in the story. Um, <laughs> they're just, I, I don't know if they're trying to be a little edgy somehow. It's like, do, you know, people smoke and people have sex and whatever. Um, they use the word smirk a lot too. I can't figure that out. <laughs> I ask them why. Why are all your characters smirking all the damn time? <laughs> um, do you even know what a smirk is like? Could you show me a smirk? Um, they'll they'll use adverbs, and adverbs are not evil. You don't have to get rid of all of them, but they'll use them in ways that don't add to the story. So they'll write a bit of dialogue and then put "he said angrily," and I'll, I'll ask them, "Okay, can show me angrily?" And so what they'll do is they'll you know hit their fist on their desk, and I said, "No, you hit your fist on the desk. Uh, there is no angrily. It doesn't exist." Uh, so adverbs like that, 
they're supposed to shade meaning, but they don't really. They kind of actually obfuscate meaning in a lot of ways. Uh, so I tell begin, you know, I see beginners do that. Um, lots and lots and lots of exposition because they have no idea how to work that in. Um, a lot of trying to write stories as if they were just films because the vast majority of the way they take in stories, pretty much all of us, even if we read a lot, is visual, you know, through TV and movies and games. And that's the point of view of a passive observer that watches other people do things. And it's hard to get them to shift into, no, you're really like a character on the stage interacting with these other characters. And then three pages later, you're this other character interacting with these other characters, one of which used to be you. Um, one of the stories, actually, it's one of the stories in, uh, I think it's the fi the, fin the final one, and let me tell you a story called How to Be a Horror Writer. I wrote it only to try to explain to one of my mentees in the, the Horror Writers Association, who was a playwright trying to write fiction, and I was like, oh my god, how do I get him to see how to, you know, how to be like in somebody else's eyes, but only them, uh, for a given scene anyway, or in a story. And so I wrote that thing just to pay attention to me. <laughs> I was thinking while I wrote it uh, so I could report back to him. And then I'm like, I oh, might as well send it out. And uh, I sent it out and sent it out and sent it out because it's so weird. But eventually I was lucky in Vestarium about it. Uh, I, I'm going to put on the show notes for folks. If you're, if you're a writer, beginning writer, whatever level you're at, make sure you have your pen and paper out while you're listening to this episode because you made so many great points. Um, so what you know there are a lot of great horror writers out there you're one of them not a lot of them teach writing not a lot of them write books on writing or teach creative writing classes um it, and in my mind that's a really great way to be to be giving to others and i'm you know probably make a paycheck for that creative writing as well but what what started you down that path is this just something that immensely rewarding for you or or how'd you get here well you know when i was in maybe junior high i noticed that i paid as much attention if not more to how the teacher taught than i did to what they were teaching you know watching what they did how they interacted with students how they were able you know communicate ideas um and then i started reading those columns from uh lawrence block right and learning so much from him from doing it and then it was you know the kind of things just sort of dovetailed together um i decided to uh to, to teach writing part-time as a way to try to you know make some money while i was working on my writing career and i s shifted over to like okay i think i'd like to do this full-time and still write because i really enjoy it so much um, also, there's just the, 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 you hear all the time that teachers will say, you learn as much, if not more than your students when you teach them. And it's true. Right. Um, I'm just fascinated with writing overall, especially, you know, genre writing and horror writing, but the insights I've gained just by trying to, you know, how do I communicate this thing to be stuff I can feel instinctively. Like when I write, uh, the hardest thing for years for me was trying to explain to, to students in a novel writing class how to like get started in that ch first chapter. And there's all kinds of terms you can use like a hook or inciting incident, and they don't seem to get it. And then I ran across, a, it was, a, I think it was an interview or an article by this gentleman, Michael Tierno, and he'd written a book called Aristotle's Poetics for Screenwriters. Um, and you can just look, you don't have to buy the book if you don't want, there's all sorts of stuff on YouTube about it. And he was talking about how all films at their core have an action idea. And he would like hyphenate it. And he got this from Socrates, I guess, or Aristotle. Um, and the idea, he said, you know, action is the core of the story. And it's more important than any one character when conceiving the story. And so he would use the example of Jaws. And he would say, Jaws is a story about a man trying to stop a killer shark. The end. Uh, the hero is whoever's trying to stop it. And that's Sheriff Brody. And you can still switch over to character stuff, but that gives you your focus on what the story problem is. Um, and so you're like, okay, I guess I better have somebody eaten by a shark at the beginning. And you've got a way to start now. Um, so th that concept helped a lot once I finally hit it. And I'm, I'm able to, to communicate it better to students, but I struggled for years because I can feel it. 
and I can tell when it's missing. And you talk to other writers, and they're like, oh, yeah, you know, they understand what it is. But it's like being a musician uh, or being a cook and trying to write about those things yes. in words without music, <laughs> without tasting things is really hard. It's really a challenge. But yeah, I just I just love it. And I really do like the fact that I can give back. You know, I'm yeah. perfectly happy if somebody asked me to do a workshop to take money if they throw it at me. But I don't really care if I get money for something. I got a day job. Oh, I'm just happy to to help if I can. It, well, I, I really admire that in a person when I hear that and, you know, that they want to give back. Teaching is definitely, writing is an art. There's a lot of great horror writers. Teaching is definitely an art as as well. My wife's a teacher. Alan Hughes here is a, is a teacher. And as I said, a lot of great horror writers, but it, it really takes something extra to be able to communicate the art of it to another individual so so yeah uh you teach history right my wife my wife teaches english I teach yeah. history and, and sometimes economics yeah what are some of the challenges when you started where my, i remember the, the first year my wife started she's like i don't remember any of this from from high school i got to learn this all over again <laughs> It's 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 not the knowledge of, of the topic. It's it's right. building connections with the students. That's that's the key to uh, to teaching. And I mean, the knowledge is important. You have to have that. But uh, if, if you can't make that person sitting there in the classroom uh, pay attention to you and, and have the same love for it you do, it's it, you know, it's the same as teaching writing. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Tim, I saw on your blog that uh, a week or so ago you wrote this. Uh, I, you, it starts off, I'm writing this at 6.23 p.m. on Christmas Day. And then you go on to talk about the holiday season, how it can be rough on a lot of people. And then what you said from there, I just thought was so key about the end of the year blues with writers and other, other art forms, I'm sure, as well. You know, people posting, writers posting, this is what I did all year. I won approximately 10,000 awards. <laughs> uh, everybody on the planet Earth has read my fiction, you know, <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, talk about that a little bit, about comparing, as my son and I have said to each other many times, comparison is one of the uh, roots of unhappiness, you know, comparing yourself mm -hmm. to other people. Uh, to, but yeah, talk but about it's that also, a bit. yeah, but it's, comparison is also one of the ways we learn. Yeah. You know, when you're, you're really, really young, you're like, oh, and you're playing with shoes or whatever. And you're like, hey, they're rocket ships. <laughs> Somebody's right. like, no, sweetie, they go on your feet and you're, or you just watch somebody do it. Well, the, and then the you're comparison, like, oh, of, uh, the comparison of learning is as opposed to the comparison of, oh, they're doing better than me. And that makes right. people really bad. Yeah. And that's like the, that's like the dark side of that. Because once you start trying to do it, you're like, how come I can't do it as easy as, you know, my mom, who's been putting shoes on her feet for the last 30 something years. <laughs> it's so frustrating because they just do it so quickly. And I think that in a lot of ways that follows us through our lives. It, it's, it's so easy. And especially, I mean, writers are so prone to, uh, you know, overthinking things. And, uh, you know, I have a, a book called um might be the teeming mind it's a uh, by i can't remember her name but she does re did it was like in the 90s she uh did research into creative writers she has this big chart of all these famous writers you know and it has like attempted suicide you know drug problem depression you know affairs divorces uh completed suicide and you see all these checks for people like you know poe and hemingway and Right. And I'm like, oh my God, if only they had antidepressants back then. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's you know, that, I, it, you know, I'll feel, you know, I tried to be really open about any kind of like, you know, negative feelings I might have about myself or whatever, uh, you know, or any kind of jealousies or envies that I might have at those times. But mostly I was just thinking about the people that would see all these things. And sometimes they'd comment or sometimes they'd make their own post elsewhere about it where they just would feel like, Oh yeah, my little short story sale that I did this year that was so important to me. It, now it's worthless because of all this stuff that right. you see. Yeah. 
And uh, yeah, I just wanted to to talk about some ways people can try to, you know, get away from that. I mean, it's it, it's really important to celebrate your own victories and be proud of your own thing that you do. Because, you know, it's like there's always a bigger, better fish somewhere, depending on how you look at it. Uh, you know, Stephen King, I don't know if he still does, but for a while he was really envious of the, of the literary community, wanted to be accepted by them, wanted to win awards like the National Book Award or whatever. Um, and they just still saw him as a popular writer. Uh, it's like, you know, dude, everybody, He's a writer, right. Even you know, King, yeah. at least, you know, all of us would change places with him in a minute. I remember years ago seeing Billy Crystal, the comedian, doing an interview on some talk show, and he was talking about how he really wanted to be a baseball player, uh, which he could have been. And I'm like, you're Billy fucking Crystal. I would love to have, have your career saying about your everyone's, everyone's clapping for me right now, but gosh, I wish they were clapping for me for this other thing, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I <laughs> wanted to be a lumberjack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you know... The, the thing is, writing or any other type of endeavor, you know, podcasting, art, whatever, on the comparison thing, it's 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 never apples to apples. You know, when you compare yourself to somebody else, did, did they have the same luck you did? Did they have more luck? You know, did they happen to know somebody that you don't know? On the flip side of this, that, uh, do you have challenges in your life that they don't have? you know, uh, whether it be illness or financial or anything else. And, you know, in my life, my chronic illness slows me down and I'm fond of telling people, yeah, I'll get it done, but I'll get it done slow. And, you know, it, it's just whatever. You're, it, I think when you talked about giving back, writing an article like that is one of the most important things, Tim, and coming from somebody such as yourself, you know, saying, hey, I do it too, but try not to do it you know just everybody's it, it sounds hokey to say but everybody is so different and when you compare yourself to someone else you're not really being fair to yourself you also risk damaging yourself as an artist you know one of the criticisms of creative writing education in america is that if you get a bunch of people together and workshop stories you, you kind of make them all bland they're all the same and you learn that, okay, this is the way all the stories are supposed to be because I have to be like everybody else. And uh, some writers never get past that. Uh, or they chase it all their lives. They're like, oh, I got to be really more descriptive. Or, oh, I got to be experimental. Or, oh, no, I got to have more sex in my stories. Because they see somebody who they really admire what they did or other people admire. You know, and they spend all that time chasing something else and they never develop themselves, you know, as artists, their own voice, their own point of view. Right, because nobody can do it like you, writing, art, anything. You know, you're, um, you know, it's it's your, when you write, like you said, finding your own voice and not trying to compare yourself to somebody else. Ronald Kelly wrote on Facebook, too, three days ago, just after the, after the new year, uh, roughly the same thing. Um, I won't read this whole thing, but he says, presently, this is a public post, so. Presently, you're expected to be writer, editor, PR expert, and a marketing pro all rolled into one. It's a lot of hard work, and some folks are much better at it than others. Um, let Matt in here. Uh, in a perfect publishing world, a writer could simply devote themselves to the craft and leave all those other skills and responsibilities for others to deal with. You know, marketing is something that I've studied all my life. Maybe somebody else, that's not their thing, but they're a great they're a great artist they're a great writer they're a great whatever right. how has talk about how it what he alludes to how it's changed writing has changed over the years with what you have to do today as opposed to maybe 20 years ago you know in some ways it's probably better if you aren't that prolific uh, in april i have two books coming out you know two weeks apart and it's one of them i wrote years ago and the other one I wrote just about a year ago or so. And it's just the way it worked out. But, you know, if you just do one at a time and then market that one at the time, and uh, or if you're indie, you might have like three you put out at the same time just to kind of maximize sales, like the part of a series or something. Um, but I think it's, it's for somebody like me where I just write a bunch of stuff, it's like 
the hell do I promote now? And it's it's and how much do I promote? Um, and I just forget sometimes too. You know, I'll do it once or twice. I'm like, okay, I'm done. Um, so, but so I think that really has changed it for a lot of people. There's this, you know, how do we interact on social media? What do we do? Uh, oh my God! Now I got to learn TikTok. What the hell's what the hell's a TikTok? Right. <laughs> That's my daughter's. What's a what is a TikTok? And I don't even go near it because I just don't don't care. But I do think there's a lot of pressure on people. Um, the good thing is there's you can find a lot of support. You can find a lot of market tips mm -hmm. uh, that you might have missed uh, other ways. But yeah, in some ways, I kind of miss the old days when there wasn't quite as much noise. Uh, you know, and you would write something for like you know several months, get it finished, and then you'd kind of move on to the the other stuff. Now it seems like we're just constantly shifting mindsets from creative to uh, you know marketing to this to that to the other thing and it's hard to do well it's like i like i tell students you know you don't when you talk about multitasking you know it, you're not really doing a good job at all those things your, your attention is like a pie you don't get more pie you just cut it into different size slices <laughs> when you do it and i think we're really our pies are cut our slices are cut pretty thin there's a lot of them these days I'm going to steal that. Go ahead, Alan. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to steal that one from my students. You can go right ahead. <laughs> the uh, be, okay, beginning writer walks up to you, up to you tomorrow and says, "Tim, should I be on social media or should I just ignore it? And if there's a medium, where's the medium? Where's where's the happy middle?" Well, there's no should. That's there isn't any should. Right. You don't even have to write if you don't want to. I mean, the whatever the whatever you do has to feed you. That's the the and hopefully, you know, make connections to the world. Uh, one of the things about writing is that it builds connections, which I think is positive. You know, you can build things or you can tear them down. And I think writing builds them. Um, but then it's like, you know, should you be on social media? I mean, I don't know. Do you have you tried it? Do you like it? Give it a shot and see. Um, but no, I don't think there's any any should. It depends on their goals. If they were telling me, you know, I want to self-publish and I want to be able to support myself with my writing, then I'd be like, hell yeah. You would, how are you going to get your your word out? And if you don't have money to advertise other places, and but really it's 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 a mixed bag in a lot of ways. I'd probably tell them not to get too involved in it. A lot of people just do a certain amount. Um Stuff I've learned about it, I don't know if it's still true, but things like for every sales post you put up, you should have three other posts that are non-sales re related. Um, I don't know if it's true, but it reminds you at least as a rule of thumb, not to constantly yakking about your books. Right. Um, I just saw there's like a over on threads that last couple of days, there was this uh, sort of dust up. There was a, a reader who was like, writers don't ever promote your book because I don't give a damn about your book. I want to know who you are first. And then if you've done something, maybe I'll check it out. And everybody, everybody was just like, Psh. yeah, you know, because they're like, how the hell am I going to get my books out there if I don't promote? And well, so there's that kind of thing. The opinion you, of one person too. That's yeah. Do you become a personality? What do you do? I, I think that the, the, the issue is, um, at least it seems to me I'm not an author, but it, it, in the last 15 years in particular, the landscape has shifted dramatically. And it, it, I think it's there are much fewer opportunities with uh, more established companies for writers to get books out. I think at least I, I just seem to think that uh, money sort of evaporated for authors, unless you're like Stephen King or something. It's very hard to make a living uh, writing. And so I sort of think that if you're just sort of getting into the biz, you may end up having to do your own electronic publishing, your own publishing on the Kindle platform and not anticipate that you're going to get a hear back from an editor or that even if you get a, a book into an, an a story into an anthology, almost always it's not professional rates. It's very hard, I think, to make a living that way. I just think that it just it it just seems to me that for writers these days, self promotion is extremely important. I and, think, and there's definitely Matt, there's definitely an art to it. You know, as someone who's I I don't want to ever call myself an expert. I just say I'm a life life lifelong student of marketing. But there's 
sake of that, there's just so much to it. A right way and a wrong way, a, a kind of a salesy way to do it that turns people off. And, you know, when I was in real estate, just starting off, my my manager said to me, people hate if they go into a clothing store and the salesperson is just all over them, won't leave them alone. They hate it. On the other hand, if they go into a clothing store and they've got a question and they can't find the salesman anywhere, they're not getting paid attention to, they hate that too. You know, so try to find the middle somewhere with what you do, Mike. And I've never forgotten that. And I do think that applies to social media, you know, in some ways. I, I think so, one of the things, and Tim may or may not, I don't, I don't know your feelings that much, but, you know, it feels like, you know, technology shifts, social media platforms shift. Me as, you know, old time traditional writer, basically some of this stuff just seems to whirl right on by me. And by the time I figure out how I'm going to market and uh, promote effectively, all of a sudden, you know, the, the, the whole landscape just, I'm, I'm exaggerating and simplifying, but, but yeah. uh, you're pretty, pretty much of my generation, I think. But do you, do you find, uh, do you find yourself bamboozled or uh, in, at times and in ways, you know, with, with the shifts uh, of the publishing landscape? Yeah, it's 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 something, you know. Not that long ago, I was collecting a, a whole bunch of my stuff for the the horror archive collection at the University of Pittsburgh, and looking through like these things, I would be like, "Oh yeah, here's a rejection I got from Del Rey for a book I sent to them. I got it back in two months, <laughs> and it was a personal letter with a whole bunch of stuff about you know what my, could be better in my book, and." Uh, and stuff like that that you'd see was in and i could watch as i was looking through some of this stuff this was just the stuff i'd art that was already in physical form or i had printed in the days when you printed everything um and i could just watch all of this kind of change and yeah it's 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 a lot like you know riding the waves you just don't know what you're gonna get well and sometimes you get wiped out <laughs> yeah i've never taken a, a tim wagon or creative creative writing class but just in listening to you tonight it's it's obvious that you have a lot to say that writers should listen to um so yeah um folks i will i will link to all of tim's writing books and you know whichever one is the best gateway for you so you made so many interesting points here today um can we talk for a few minutes about your other books as well while we, while we got you here? Sure. Now you've of got, a, first of all, you've got a, a new book coming out in a, what, a couple of months called Lord of the Feast. Yeah, it's in April. In April. And I just, in I read April. The, uh, Thank you for sending me the, the a review copy. I haven't read it yet, but I just, I asked you about it in an email because it looks pretty interesting. And, and Rick and I were talking about this briefly the other day. Um, talk about the new book and it, it's it's about a cult who creates their god right right yeah yeah they're they're not exactly an, an apocalyptic cult but it's it follows through with some of the mythos that goes through some of my other stories where um one of the big tensions is like you know if you know you live in a world where it's going to end or in a case you're going to die uh, how how do you live with that? How do you make terms for that? So I often represent this as just like entropy, like at the, the, the center of all creation is just a great big black hole sucking everything in. The whole universe's only purpose is to feed it. And so there's this kind of tension instead of good and evil, it's almost like, um, okay, your, your hospice worker is trying to make, make this process as comfortable as possible, maybe stretch it out, keep the universe as healthy as you can for as long as you can. Or you're like, the universe is suffering. We need to kill it now. It's a mercy. <laughs> and um, so these people, it's a family who are part of the, you know, we need to kill it now. It's a mercy cult. And they're sick of waiting for something to come along and sort of be a messiah for this. And they want to go ahead and, you know, build one themselves. So in that sense, it's a little bit like a Frankenstein story, uh, only with magic. Um, the, the story is about how they tried to do it and it didn't work. 
uh, then they separated the pieces of the god because they had pieces they put together and the pieces kind of fell apart. Uh, after the ritual, the pieces aren't rotting. But they hope one day to get the ritual right. So the family members take possession of different pieces. And now, years later, they've, they're, they think they're ready. Uh, at least one of the matriarchs thinks she's ready. And she's trying to gather all the pieces so she can go ahead and resurrect this god and finally bring about the, you know, the merciful end to everything. Um, so, you know, it was a lot of fun. I write a... I write what I call interludes, which are the stories of the various body parts. So it's like, here's the story of the <laughs> eyes, like the person who they stole the eyes from, took the eyes from. That was fun. And I created um, a place called the House of Red Tears, which is a business where uh, the the matriarch is trying to resurrect the god. Um, she furnishes serial killers with victims so they can come and go there, pay a fee, kill them. You know, completely safely, kind of like in hostel, where you can go there. You have a place. It's a growth industry, she, yeah, yeah. And she's <laughs> harvesting the souls of each of these people killed, so she's going to be using those things to help power, power her spell. But uh, writing about the house of red tears is fun, and so it follows some of the mythos of some of my other stories. But you can read it completely on your own uh, or on its own. I mean, it's weird because the other book that's coming out in April that I wrote years later also uses that same mythos but i'm doing it more in a lighter urban fantasy way during COVID, i got curious because i had a lot of time on my hands of course i got curious if i could do that could i take all these weird horror concepts and just kind of edge them toward it's like changing the dials you know mixing right. more could i make it more of an adventure kind of thing and it just occurred to me a couple of days ago oh my god these two very different approaches to the same mythos are going to be coming out within two weeks of each other so it'll be interesting if anybody reads both of them to see what they think. Well, I said to, to Rick, not having read it yet, I said, this strikes me as cosmic horror, or Lovecraftian, whatever you want to call it. But a, a huge difference being that they're creating their God instead. Right. Right. Yeah. And he, what you, you said there was a precedent for it a long time ago, Rick, right? That you're, you're muted, buddy. You all right? You're, let me see if I can un unmute you. There we go. All right, you let me know when you're unmuted and we can talk about it. Um, I used to be able to, to do it for people. In uh, that looks like you got there it. There you go. There yep. you go. Sorry. Oh, it's Sorry no problem. That. No problem. Um, that concept of... Uh... Worship is the power of belief, creating the God, as first accounted in a story by L. Sprigley Camp called The Kami Appalling, which was said in Atlantis. And it was about a group of con men who just want to create a, you know, invent a God just so they can rip off the worshippers with donations, and the God comes alive and kills them. <laughs> and it's popped up in a, there was a British writer named, uh, we used the pseudonym of Jack Man. He was also known as E.C. Vivian. I forget what his real name was. He had about five different aliases. And he was just grinding out these occult detective uh, mysteries about a character named Jeez. And he he uses that concept of uh, God surviving only, only so long as he has believers. Right. That's that's kind of in Supernatural, too, with the old, old gods. Um like the, the 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 very supernatural Christmas episode, they're talking about how the 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 two or two gods are talking about how demigods, whatever you want to call them, saying that they're a lot weaker because fewer people believe in them and so forth. But I I Was told it? Rick about the book. And I said this looks so interesting. I don't remember reading anything quite like this before this concept, and uh, I knew if if it had if it was out there somewhere, Rick would know. So and he did. And as I said before, it's it's impossible to come up with a totally original idea. Right. The treatment of it may be different than anybody's done it before. Right. There's always, you know, there's so much written out as this hidden away in the dark corners of literature, some precedent for what you're doing. Right. Yeah. Uh speaking of supernatural, you've written you you've written several supernatural books, right? And uh 
Yep. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I just said, yep. <laughs> oh, uh, Tar, how did, how did that come about? Um, I, I, I was watching the show and I saw they came out. So I emailed, uh, uh, Keith DeCandido was one of the writers. And so I just emailed him and said, Hey, Keith, who's your editor? I want to, <laughs> want to write one of these. And so he told me, and uh, I could only do this because I'd already done tie-ins. So, you know, I, right. you know, wasn't super famous at it or anything, but I had enough of a track record. I felt comfortable just emailing somebody. And, uh, you know, I emailed the editor and she's like, oh, you know, we don't have anything right now, but, you know, we'll let you know. And I'm like, well, okay. And, you know, I took my shot. And then somebody had to whatever reasons pull out of a project and she, you know, just got in touch with me. So I did three books for them. Oh, there's that a lesson original somewhere adventures. right there too. Yeah. And then it happened again. Uh, she recommended me to uh, Inside Editions. They were trying to do a supernatural choose your own adventure uh, type book. And the, the the writing team that were doing it, they pulled out. And so, you know, he contacted me. He's like, oh, yeah, they said you did a good job on these. And I'm like, OK, <laughs> you know, you just never know when something's going to pay off. Right. Uh, it, it helps to it helps to ask. Doesn't hurt to ask. Like my mom always said, the worst they can do is say no. Yeah, exactly. And if you don't ask, the answer is no. Already, right, yeah. right. Uh, Alan, I think you wanted to ask him about uh, something as well. Oh, I'm just. Uh, I enjoyed the Necropolis uh, series quite a bit. I read that. Uh, read that a dozen years ago, and I was going back through it recently, and uh, I was just amazed at some of the things I didn't catch, like the. Uh, the Kolchak reference in the uh, first. Yep. Uh, as I as I go through the rest of the series again, is there anything that I might be on the lookout for? Any other crossover? Oh campaign? Lord, I don't know. Um, Reach back into your memory, Tim. <laughs> there's there's so many. I don't remember how many there are at this point. One of my favorites was in the second book, where the hero is like in their in Tenebrous, which is their version of prison. And there's a whole bunch of different vampires in there claiming to be Dracula. Like no, nobody knows who Dracula really is. And I'm like, I did that because there's so many versions in the movies that I loved. And I'm like, let's make them all real. I love that series. There's, there's, so, many ideas. there's so many ideas that just pop up and, and uh, it could have been a whole story of book itself, but you just bring it up and zip on through. The, yeah, it was just, it's my love letter to all the monster movies that I just adored as a kid. And my only regret is that I, end, it's, as I was finishing the third book, like a lot of times, as I get to the ending, a new idea pops into my head. So I use that for the ending. And, you know, I kind of ended it on a cliffhanger and uh, they didn't want to do any more books. And so I still get emails from people saying, where's the, where's the next one? And I'm like, uh, I did do uh, the, the first new story in in years that's in the uh, anthology called dead detectives uh and uh it's said after the third book but i just basically say the cliffhangers is over <laughs> and he's back to his normal job i didn't say I, how I, it got resolved i've got the graphic audio version of that but i'm gonna wait till i uh yeah. reread it all right yeah i thought they did a good job that was a lot of fun so i love i, the I, graphic I like audio that company so. a lot yeah yeah i do too yeah, I wish they hadn't lost their contract with DC because yeah. you know I, I they they've got maybe eight to ten graphic uh, graphic audio DC comics and I would love to hear more of them. Mm -hmm. you know, movie in your mind, as they say. That's right. I, I forgot to say to the audience that when we were talking about Lord of the Feast, that you can go ahead and and pre-order it on Kindle or or print and I'll include that link in the show notes. And that really is for anyone listening, you think, Oh, I'm going to read this book when it comes out, pre-order it now. That's really important to the writer and the, and the publisher. So uh, try to do that. Um, thanks for being here, Tim. And thanks for being so patient with me and my, with my internet troubles earlier in the week and, and coming and doing this tonight. Appreciate that. It's no problem at all. And thanks so much for having me. I had a great time. Oh, absolutely. Uh, we're going to talk about a few other things. You're totally welcome to stay, or if if it's dinner time and you need to go, that's fine too. Just no, no, I, I don't have anywhere to be. All right. Well, f first topic is <laughs> I saw, uh, and you posted about this, Mark. There was a little bit on Facebook today from several people about audiobooks, 
And I think somebody must have said somewhere, well, that's not really reading. Yeah, I don't think I even saw the source of that. I saw several writers addressing the point, and I put my two cents worth in in a couple of places. But um, so I made uh, basically the same post on Facebook that, uh, yeah, I consider audiobooks basically reading and it a lot of it just sounded like an argument about semantics there was a lot more uh disagreement it seemed about what constitutes actually reading as opposed to absorbing content like, like and when, when i when we read our kids books at night when they're little that's reading. <laughs> yeah, I be, and, and a lot of people just want to be contrary. Just, you know, it's the typical social media curse. You know, you make a point and there's going to be a nasty disagreement, even if there's no real disagreement. So yeah, stuff like that I take with a grain of salt. But I thought it was a a, a point worth articulating, which is yeah. like what I did. and And it's not about the vehicle it's about what you absorb as to whether it's uh, you know people red i suppose forget that we've been reading on the printed page for what 250 years 200 years and before that thousands possibly millions of years uh, it was all oral s storytelling you know they were they were listened to audible listening to audible back then yeah. around the camp campfire um so I, yeah i don't see the i don't really see the issue and like you said some people just want something to be outraged about yeah. but but yeah the other thing is you know listening to a book or story being read from someone who's really good at it can really add a dimension for you that wasn't there uh, when you just read it on the printed page and I'll never say one is better than the other, but you, there is that added dimension from a really great narrator. You know, I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, well, let's use Stephen King. His story is novella N that I watch, that I, that I really, really like a lot. And if you listen to the audiobook version of that, they've got three different narrators, and it's just so, so great. Uh, Crouch End. You know, you can read it on the page, and it's it's a wonderful Lovecraftian story. It really is. But then listen to Tim Curry read it, and there's 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 an added dimension, like I said, to it. So I got to say, Mike, when uh, Harry Potter came out, um, I ended up uh, I read the first book. This was right back at the beginning of the craze, and I thought this is really a juvenile book. You know, I, I know all the hype, but then what I did was I started getting the discs to listen to in the car with my kids and they had the same narrator read all of the books. Yeah. Jim Dale, if I'm not mistaken. And he did a bang up job and I ended up yeah. very much enjoying the experience of having him read in those voices to me throughout the whole series and I didn't get distracted by the fact that I thought some of the behavior and language was a little juvenile. Do, do you know what I mean? It's just yeah. like, I'm in a car, he's telling me a story. And it was very enjoyable. That's how I read, like read, listened to all of the Harry Potter books after that first one. Never even picked up the books themselves. For what it's worth, I was exactly the same way. Read the first one, listened to the rest of them. What do you think of that language in the first one? I was wondering if maybe I'm a little. It's been a long time. I I don't remember necessarily thinking it was that juvenile. Obviously, I mean, obviously written for a younger grade, but it engaged me. I I, I enjoyed it well enough. Uh, one more example that I mean, I love audiobooks. I get my two credits every month on on Audible. Yeah, me too, know, and so forth. Uh, there's a an author by the name of Alex North. I don't know if anyone here has read him, but he's he's a really great writer. And that was the wreck you gave me, wasn't it? 
Yeah, it was. The mm-hmm. Shadows okay. was the name of the book. And I'll tell you, that's another one. I, I think The Shadows is one of the creepiest audio books I've ever listened to. And of course, setting is important. I usually, I'll read books on my Kindle a lot. And then when I'm tired, I'll get in bed and I'll pick it right up where it, where, where I ended on the Kindle. I'll pick it up with the audio book. So as a result, I tend to listen to a lot of audiobooks at night. Well, this one, it's the perfect one to listen to at night. It's a very, very creepy story. So anyone out there that likes audiobooks, pick up mm-hmm. The Shadows by Alex North. Yeah, yeah. yeah. my these days, uh, you know, I've, I've always been a voracious reader, but my eyes don't hold up like they used to. You know, I did uh, right. for years, for 40 years, I worked on a computer screen eight hours a day or more and then i'd come home and then i'd write all evening and nowadays i mean trying to read a printed page or even on a kindle a lot of times after 15 minutes my eyes just start blurring out that's it so i've started listening to a lot more audiobooks i'd say in the last uh couple of years and uh a lot of times a narrator can definitely make or break the book. And I've been fortunate it, it, I've actually found more good ones than poor ones. And one of my favorite lately was actually the exorcist that's read by William Peter Blatty. And he, he was magnificent. And the thing that was so cool is, you know, so much of the dialogue in the book is word for word from the movie, but he managed to do those characters that pulled me out of, if I read it in the novel myself, I'm hearing the movie car- characters doing it because I'm so familiar with that movie. But hearing him do those characters, I mean, in some cases there was commonality there, but uh, he put a whole new dimension on abs- on me absorbing that book than I would have gotten had I just reread it again, I think. Well, you mentioned here's, to me. Here's another, okay, so like yeah. I loved reading to my kids, but we ended up getting the Benicula books on cassette tape and they were all read by victor garber Ah. so in my head that was the sound of the characters voices till the very last book i think it's edgar Allan crow they got a completely different narrator and i was so bummed i was almost to the point of being incensed because my favorite characters didn't sound like they were supposed to sound even though the new narrator, I forget his name now, he did a fine job, but he just wasn't Victor Garber, you know? Well, Mark, you mentioned the last thing I'll say on this, um, then we'll move on, but you mentioned to me a couple of weeks ago or a month or so ago that uh, you were listening to a lot of audiobooks lately while while walking. Yeah, and yeah, I, I, I walk I, about I, three miles a day and that yeah. comes in well, really you, handy. You told me that, I, I told you, hey, the, the keep, just got put on audible a couple of years ago and yeah. you're like that's my next listen so what have I did. you gotten to that one yet oh yeah i i finished it uh, a couple of weeks ago yeah i thought the narrator did a great job very good uh, yeah you know that the stephen king's narrator is usually the same guy too for all of his books for the older ones yes yeah, yeah i don't know about name. the newer ones i used to get them all to listen and to- we listened to pet cemetery recently and it was michael c hall you know dexter he was he was wonderful he he was uh, I, I, he was the perfect, absolutely perfect narrator for that. I don't think they could have chosen anyone to get the characters better. So a patron sent me this this message, and let's see. I was wondering if it would be possible to pass along a message and a question to Mister Rick Clay. Firstly, of praise as I've read his article on. Robert E. Howard's Gods and Blood and Thunder, and I'm gobsmacked. Truly incredible work to have researched, correlated, compiled, and interpreted so much disparate data and having arrived at such a well-thought-out and coherent synthesis of Howard's fascinating, albeit messy, and complete lore. Secondly, if he has the time to answer a question, I was wondering what he made of the door of the world and how he sees it relating to Howard's pantheon. To me, the door is the story that really ties together the whole, I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce this, Sherwin O'Donnell, Conrad, and company tales together. So um, so for if you're listening, Sasha, 
Rick actually, he sent me an email and said that he's actually got a uh, little essay on this that was circulated privately some time back. Is that right, Rick? Written for the Robert E. Howard uh, United Press Association. Yeah. Eventually, I'm hoping to put it together in a book. Yeah. So do you want to talk about this for a minute or two? Well, first of all, what we're talking about is a fragment, an incomplete story that you can find in Pictures in the Fire from uh, Robert E. Howard Foundation Press. Oh, and I should have said, Rick said it's okay to send this to the Patreon. So, Sasha, you'll be reading this. Well, okay. Basically, what he was referring to, I, I did I, I did an article which uh, won an award for the Ukrainian from uh, Robert E. Howard United Press Association. Well, presided in the Gods of the Robert E. Howard Universe, which I'm not going to go much deeply into because I, I have a different take than what he, he thought in this story, Door, uh, in door to, of the World. It has a um, demon or a god who is haunting this uh, garden with white flowers in another dimension. And uh, in the, the article I had done on Poseidon and the gods of the Robert E. Howard universe, I had talked about Robert E. Howard's version of the devil from Digging No Grave and tied it into a lot of things. He borrowed from the King in Yellow. He borrowed from uh, the Peacock King and E. Hoffman Price's work. He borrowed from uh, Ehrlich and uh, Robert W. Chambers. And uh, this uh, Pantheon viewer felt that maybe this the, the demon called Bagog in the, the door of the world was this devil as well. And I don't think so. Hmm. I think he's similar to a nameless demon who appears in a Conan story called The Veil of Lost Women, in which he is a bat-like creature which is haunting a garden of uh, white flowers. The most is fragment in the Conan story. I think it might be that creature, which is the scrub, which Rob, which uh, Conan, when he fights, describes as a very minor demon, and he's kind of shrugs him off, saying, "I can beat guys like that." I mean, he's not the most satanic individual in the universe. All right. Well, so I'll, that's I'll send that. Yeah. My answer. I'll, I'll send that to all the patrons. Um, thanks for letting me do that uh so you guys did you see rebel moon i haven't seen it yet no 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 uh, it's gotten a lot of negative press in terms of reviews so i've decided I, I i started it i watched the first 15 minutes and it was really kind of slow moving it looked you like know, they're trying to see where it, it was going it's to... like very much wait yeah. for the four hour version <laughs> right well it looks like he's Pulling it, he's using everything. Star Wars, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit. But of... the rumor that I heard was this was a Star Wars movie he had an idea for, and he couldn't sell it. And now with everything kind of crumbling, uh, I guess they said, "Well, this is not a Star Wars movie. This is not a Marvel superhero movie. This isn't a DC universe movie. It must be good. Let's throw money at it." Um. But I just, like I said, the first 10 minutes or so, it was like, it, it was actually kind of, I, it was building up to something that I thought was going to be extremely cliche. And so I just lost interest. Yeah. Maybe I should have kept going. I'm going to vote no, because I haven't seen it yet either. And I have a limited amount of hours left in my life. So uh, who has anyone here seen any of it or you watched it? What do you think? Yeah. You, you, your prediction was right. It, I mean, it does build to a pretty often told story, and uh, and uh, I'm kind of already. I'll I'll weigh my predictions down on which character is going to turn out to be the the missing princess in the next story. And oh, there's more. Oh, there's a second movie coming out. <laughs> of course, there is. 
Oh wait, there's more. Yeah. Can we have it in the trilogy? I think it's just two movies. Two movies. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know, Alan. I don't know. You're a better man than I because I don't think I can watch sit through it. I'm so tired of Drek. Yeah. Yeah, I hear that. Um Aquaman too, I heard did pretty terribly in the theater as well. Well, you got okay, so like I got a question about some of these movies that earned a billion dollars. Yeah. Which is an outrageous amount of money. But part of that was pre-pandemic, you know, and the buildup that was happening with the Avengers story. So there's an incredible amount of excitement every time a superhero movie released. And the box office was huge because I think for both Captain Marvel and Aquaman, it's not like there was any substance there to support that kind of box office. I think it was just in a place and a time when even if it didn't merit it, a superhero movie was going to like really rake it in. Well, that's all been incredibly deflated now. And yeah. uh, there's a lot of bad press about superhero movies at this time. You know, I think that they were just sort of like done in by being at the end of a genre. I grew weary quickly. Yes. I'm a Always saturation guy. with television. With the streaming Disney streaming service, well, it's also oversaturation with quality that wasn't that great. You know, it's one thing like if it had been like, oh, we have this embarrassment of riches, but we just have an embarrassment. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sandy I, Peterson's got a new uh, uh, Call of Cthulhu uh, RPG out. It's called Alone Against the Static. So if you gamers out there, um, I emailed Sandy and we're going to talk to him sometime next week. We're not sure when, and then we'll, we'll air that, but man, the reviews for this game are really, really good. Everyone's saying it's really great. So if, if that's your thing, check it out. And I'll, I'll include a link to that too in the show notes. So, uh, talk a little more after the, after the break. You you have thoughts. I have thoughts. You have thoughts. Okay. The the weird library, my other podcast, brand new podcast, fiction podcast is live. The first episode. So, I hope you'll check it out. The uh, music and art was done by our friend and panelist Bridget Brenmark, and I'm doing an intro introduction to each episode, kind of a. E.G. Marshall mystery theater kind of thing. What was the story, Mike? Uh, it's from Emma J. Gibbons' collection, uh -huh. which was an NPR book of the year in 2020 uh, called Dark Blood Comes from the Feet. And the story is titled... It's Black... about foot fetish vampires? Uh, no. Oh, no. It, that's, but there's a possibility of a story there, you got to admit. I don't think I do. I think Count Dracula, I'm here to test your corns. Uh, wow. Oh, so anyway, I yeah, it's called, the, it's called... I didn't make up the feet story. Yeah, it's called Black Shuck Tavern. Yeah, yeah, I listened to it today, and I was rather taken with... Uh, Bridget's a good narrator, and, yeah. uh, you know, it only runs, what, about 25 minutes? It, uh, it was very engaging, so I I just love the idea of, of the podcast and, uh, you know, where where you get kind of a uh, a short take of an audio book it's very yeah. cool well i really appreciate it um so i hope everybody checks it out and tells their friends uh we got anything else to talk about dr who did we talk about dr who last time or not we did talk about the goblin episode yes yeah okay when's the next episode like in april or may april yeah yeah okay I saw someone else, maybe, I don't know if anyone here has seen it, maybe you have, maybe Alan has, there's a movie out called Bunker, came out a couple of years ago, set in World okay. War One. about there's some something near the trench, something evil's coming out of it, and they're British soldiers. Hmm. Does that ring a bell? 
No. But that doesn't mean anything. Bunker? A bunker. Or bunker, something like why, that. Well, why are you bringing There's it up? A, just... Oh, it's just, I'm looking for movie There's ideas. For movie night. What, Alan? Oh, there was a video game called The Bunker hmm. Amnesia, The Bunker that came out that was set in World War One, but uh, that still might be a movie. Woman in Black 2 was set in World War Two, I think, and it wasn't actually bad for a sequel, I thought. I thought it was pretty, pretty okay. I mean, it's never going to approach the first movie, which I thought was brilliant. And I, I love the book, too. I hope someday they'll do a movie or TV uh, streaming or whatever version of uh, The Man in the Picture by Susan Hill, who, of course, she's the author of The, the Woman, Woman in Black as well. But uh, speaking of audio books, yeah, uh, that's a great audio book, The Man in the Picture. And so is uh, The Woman in Black. Great narrators for both those. Uh, Bunker says 2022 is when it came out. Trapped in a bunker during World War I, okay, a group of soldiers are faced with an ungodly presence that slowly turns them against each other. Sounds kind of like what you described, Matt. I just was wondering if anyone had seen if it was any good. I'm, I'm have fleshing out my movie list for the coming year. Well, what are you guys watching this Saturday? We're watching a double feature. The first is uh, an artsy piece that I think was made for the film festival circuit called The Last Case of August T. Harrison, which is oh, about I've a seen that. Yeah. I, I haven't seen it yet. It has Terry Lacey from Dark Shadows. Pardon me? It has, it has a actor from Dark Shadows, Terry Lacey, in it. I see. It, it's basically uh, this guy finds out that Lovecraft's stories somehow tie into the mystery he's investigating. But then that turns out that's only about 55 minutes long or so. So I picked a second movie, which is more, I think, horror comedy called Lake Michigan Monster. Well, speaking of movies, here's a news article for you, Matt. James Wan dives into Lovecraftian horror with Call of Cthulhu adaptation. Great. Let's see what you got, buddy. Yeah. I don't know. Isn't this the guy who directed Aquaman? I think. You know, you know, do you guys know uh, Ken Harms? Uh, so. He, um, if I'm getting the name right, he's the guy who wrote the Cthulhu Mythos Encyclopedia. Daniel. Daniel Harms. I'm sorry, yeah, Dan Harms. Oh, sorry. yeah. Ken Harms. Oh, yeah. Ken Harms. yeah. Okay, so he's getting together, I think, a second comprehensive volume, maybe to be put out, I, I mean, a new or fourth edition, rather, more comprehensive or something. And uh, he was looking, he's writing notes to people and you kind of read between the lines, you look, he's trying to flesh out this, this book, I think. Mm -hmm. But he wanted to know like, what were some of the trends in the last two decades in fandom in the mythos? And I thought one thing that has struck me a little bit is that Lovecraft is coming a little bit more to the mainstream cinematically. And I don't just mean like, oh, uh, they're quoting Devermus Mysterious and Hellboy. Mm -hmm. You know, like I was thinking the color out of space or color out of space, because it had Nick Cage, it got a little bit of attention. And then uh, the um, having to curiosities had two Lovecraftian episodes, regardless of how good or bad they were, how terrible Crispin Glover's accent was. Um, and uh, then more recently, of all the things to do this, but Lovecraft Country was popular for a while on Netflix, and that got the name out there in front of a lot of people. Now, people are probably assuming that that dross was somehow related to a Lovecraftian story. So to me, this idea of a mainstream Call of Cthulhu adaptation is just sort of part of something that's gathering steam and in the next 10 years, I'd say we're going to see more direct adaptations. Well, Lovecraftian readers and fans have been wanting something like this for a long time. Uh, okay, so James Wan, he did the Conjuring movies yeah. too, right? Yeah. Which I, I don't know. 
don't shoot me, but I kind of enjoyed. They were okay. I can't keep the Conjuring and the Insidious series apart. I don't know. For some reason, they just blend in my mind. They're not bad. I think I've only uh, watched the first Insidious. Yeah. I think we saw one of the other. Kim and I watch about a movie a night, and the, after a while, it's it's like, you know, years ago, a movie was an event. It it imprinted yeah. on, on one of my you know the the little folds in my brain right there it was pretty well imprinted there now i can't remember what i watched two days ago or last week you know because it's just overkill but we we can't stop watching movies you know it's, <laughs> it's hey, just what you're having do. a good time with someone that yeah. you love right yeah so. yeah definitely now we watched last night we watched martyrs the french uh 2008 film that was it was fairly intense i i'd heard in some quarters that was actually fairly traumatic. I wouldn't go that far, but you know, it was pretty intense. Um, and w one of my favorites recently was when evil lurks. That was, uh, that was, I forget if that was Netflix or what, but it was, uh, a neat take on, uh, on the undead and plague and all this stuff. It, that was, that was a good one. Uh, oh yeah. Kelly was telling me, Kelly Young was telling me how much he, enjoyed that movie did, did that have a lot of uh or some body horror type horror in that movie um, did, Tim, did you see that you see maybe that? yeah it was gory <laughs> yeah, yeah okay, i mean you know yeah it it was gory i was, was trying to think <laughs> kelly told me it was good but i haven't seen it i remember now he told me i wouldn't like it because of the body horror so uh, sounds like though it was a good movie Mm -hmm. so the body yeah. horror well is the done. one reason I don't really want to watch Suitable Flesh, even though I kind of want to watch yeah, it. Yeah, I'm not going to watch it. So that's not <laughs> that's that's not me saying the movie is bad or anything. Just I, that's not my thing. Did your wife watch the Toy Maker episode of Doctor Who with you? <laughs> me? Yes. Uh, it, no, it, I was thinking of the dolls. No, but I uh, thank her you out. for the idea, though. I it, I need to rewatch it with <laughs> her. <laughs> my wife doesn't like doll movies. They scare. I read this really good um, short story online, uh, online magazine the other day about the Uncanny Valley. Uh, if I remember it before the episode goes up, I'll include it in the show notes. But it was so good. Um, yeah. Oh, that's frustrating. Uh, that's my memory for you. Um, all right, guys. Anything else? Thanks for the kind words about the weird library, Mark. Appreciate oh, sure. That. Well, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, the continuation, and uh, I believe you have one of my stories in there. I, yeah, I do. I will definitely spread the word. You know, last but not least. And people screaming. <laughs> That's what it's all about. <laughs> the uh, Matt, you were familiar with um, Jeff Thomas's Unknown Country right i've got a copy of that book somewhere really God, i don't know where any not a lot of are. them there's not a lot of them I, uh, jeff jeff sent me this and i don't know the uh, i i hate to say this but this is going to be my first unknown country book but it just seems like a very fascinating concept to me um if you didn't catch that. This one's called um, The Spirit of Place by Jeffrey Thomas. So it's it's put out by somebody. Earthling Publications. There we you go. know, one thing I got to say is Jeff retired from his regular job. It might have been when he was 62. You know, he just started taking Social Security, said to heck with it. He wasn't making very much money. And now... He's got enough to live on for him and his daughter, and he's writing more. I was just he's not busting his this. tail. Yeah, he's I, not busting his tail in an eight-hour, ten-hour. I, I was just tub. saying this to Danielle the other night. I was like, Jeff is pretty happy these days, you know, because he doesn't have to work at a job anymore. Now he's now he's now he's writing. There's a lot for less years, stress. It's like, God, like, oh, yeah. Jeff, you got to write again. Now it's like we like 10 years it was almost like well, geez. like what do we do to get his brother scott again 
Well, but if it was Jeff a fair world, great. if it was a fair world, Jeff Scott, Jeff, Jeff and Scott Thomas would, you know, have bestsellers once or twice a year, but it isn't. But these guys are really great writers. And if it check this out, folks, get the spirit of place by Jeffrey Thomas. It's, um, this is a beautiful book besides all that too. Jeff, thank you for sending this to me. In the middle of the month, we're going to do a Patreon podcast with Jeff Thomas and talk about the unknown country and and his work and the joys of retirement will come yeah. up, I'm sure. Yeah, I just retired this past year. Last year I retired and I've been busting ass trying to produce and I think it's paying off. And I'm I am a lot happier than having to divide up the writing time with uh, the day job. Uh, I've got a couple of um, Philip K. Dick essays and his writings and so forth. They try to organize them. One of his essays that he wrote like in the seventies. He's like, I wish I could go to a job and write like you know example example example. I just can't do it. So I don't have two pennies to my name, and I'm always eating mac and cheese and you know, that kind of thing. So it's, yeah. Anyway, Tim, thank you so much for, for being here tonight. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. Uh, thanks for putting up with, with tonight's brain fog, but we got there. Um, Mark Rainey, he's going to be a sometime uh, panelist. On, yeah. I'll, on... I'll try to make it a little more than just uh, sometime, depending on the schedule, right. you know, do my best. I you know, really, I, you know, really enjoy coming all the time. I enjoy having you. And I just, I don't know. You're just a really great guy. I think you're a great person. So I'm glad you're doing this. <laughs> 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 I got that Davis fooled. <laughs> Still working on everybody else, but I, that's one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anyway, Tim, thanks so much for, for talking about your books and your writing and uh, for all the, uh, great lessons you threw out there even tonight for free so appreciate it of course all right well thanks everybody special thanks to all the patrons who who make it happen and, and keep the keep the whole thing running really appreciate you guys and um we will talk to you next time